With the changes that Fabriano made to their Fabriano Artistico hot press watercolor paper, is it still a suitable surface for colored pencil? Find out today. Plus, I am going to be doing a tutorial of this rosella and colored pencil over an airbrushed background. I don't remember what it was, maybe a year, maybe two years ago, we started seeing a lot of complaints from watercolor artists who used the new version of the Fabriano Artistico. Fabriano themselves have said that they made no changes to the paper itself, or it wasn't supposed to have changed, but they did start printing money, I believe it was. I could have that wrong, but I think it was something like printing money on their presses and the watercolor paper ended up changing. A lot of watercolor artists have had tons of problems with this paper since. So I wanted to see if this was going to be a problem for us as colored pencil artists. I ordered a batch of the 16 by 20 inch, 140 pound watercolor paper back in, I wanna say it was January of last year. February, January. It just came about a month ago. So it was on back order for about a year. So I'm certain that this is the new version and I could definitely see the difference between this and my old sheets of paper. One of you guys warned me that it didn't work so well with masking fluid. So that was my first test. I tried that out on both sides of the paper because sometimes with paper, one side will react completely different than the other. So I tried it on both sides and unfortunately you were very right on this. It wasn't good. It caused the paper to feel a little bit fuzzy, changed the texture of the paper, and it stained it. And I've never had my Winsor & Newton masking fluid, even though it has that yellow tint, I've never seen it actually stain the paper. So we started off badly. This was not a good first impression of the new batch of paper. So I knew that wasn't going to be a good idea. I ended up using my frisket and just cut around my subject so that I could protect the paper for the airbrushing portion of this. Now, I know not everybody is going to use airbrush paint with colored pencil, so this part may not affect you one way or another. But for me, I found that the paper did not hold its shape quite as well as it used to. Normally, it would dry back completely, completely flat. It did stretch a little bit more than what I'm used to seeing with this paper. It wasn't terrible, but it was noticeable. You may want to size your paper first. I've never had to do that with this paper, so I did not pre-stretch or pre-soak this paper before before I got started, just never needed to before. I will have to try that in the future and see if it makes a difference. For the colored pencil portion, I mostly worked with light layers and with odorless mineral spirits. And I have to say, I was pretty surprised because I mean, we kind of started out on a bad foot here. Wasn't thinking this relationship was gonna work out too well, gonna have to find a new paper. I think I might've liked it better for how I work anyway with colored pencil than how the old batch was, which I was definitely not expecting. I didn't need as many layers as I normally would in order to blend it out with odorless mineral spirits and have really, really good color saturation. It's almost like the pigment wanted to sit on top of the paper more than soak in. And for how I work, that was actually a good thing. I did have to adjust a few techniques and we'll talk about that in the actual tutorial. If you are supporters over on Patreon, I have a three hour version of this tutorial available for you now so you can head over and check that out. If you're unfamiliar with Patreon, each week you get a new one to two hour, apparently sometimes three hour long tutorial, complete with voiceover, lots of tips, along with some other rewards for as little as $4 a month. I've got 150, actually over 150 videos already there ready for you to watch, again, just for that $4 a month. So you are getting a huge value, lots of lessons. Now let's move on to this tutorial and talk more about the paper as we work. This portion you can see in real time on the live stream, I will have a card pop up so you can check that out. But essentially I've covered everything with my frisket, which is basically a low tack transparent tape, a big piece of it. And then I cut my, I used an X-Acto knife to cut my shape out. And now I can just airbrush over everything. I don't have to worry about staying clean or getting airbrush paint where I don't want it on the portions where the colored pencil will go. So I used a stencil, added some of my circles, and then I airbrushed green on top of it to tone it down. So again, you can see that all in real time over on the live stream. So this part is going very fast because we did do this in real time there. The next thing that I started with on the bird, I like to get the darkest areas in first. So on him, that's going to be his eyes. That way it makes it easier for me to judge the rest of the values around him. As I laid the pencil down at this stage, it felt pretty similar to how the Fabriano Artistico normally does. I didn't notice a huge difference here. My first layer, then I'm going to add some additional layers on top of that, and then I will blend out with odorless mineral spirits. The thing that was so odd to me is it almost felt like the, the pigment sat on top of the paper instead of soaking in. So even with the first time through of blending with odorless mineral spirits, I didn't have as much of the grainy gritty look as I normally would. And that was really quite a surprise for me. 
to get everything this smooth, I usually will put three to five layers of colored pencil, blend out with odorless mineral spirits, three to five more layers of colored pencil, blend out with odorless mineral spirits. I repeat that process a few times before I get it very smooth. And early on, this was coming out very smooth. Now you can see, especially on the areas where I have the blue right now, you can see a bit of that gritty grainy feel, more of the tooth of the paper. The tooth of the paper was really different, noticeably different from what I've used before with the Fabriano Artistico. And I tried it on both sides and found the same. It looked very similar on both sides, actually, whereas with the old batch, I could always tell the front and the back apart from each other very easily. This seemed a little bit closer on both sides to me. I didn't notice a huge difference from one to the next but you can see a more definite pattern the thing was once I layered it did not take very many layers to get rid of that and have something that came out very very smooth so I was happy with that another thing that was a, a bit odd with this paper where I airbrushed there was a very weird texture to it when I run my hand over it it has this very rough almost sandpaper like texture so that was odd I've, I never noticed that before on the old batch of Fabriano Artistico it doesn't really matter it looks the same I mean people hopefully are not going to be running their hand over my artwork but I thought that was a bit odd I even had a friend touch it as well because I'm like is it this in my head you can you feel the difference here and she's like wow that that really is a noticeable difference where I had airbrushed it it's like the paper doesn't handle water that well anymore or not like it used to anyway which is kind of weird given that it is a watercolor paper as I work through this on his head, notice that I'm paying attention to the light and dark areas. It's very easy to look at your reference photo on a bird like this and say, okay, he has a yellow head and just shade it all in yellow. Look closer, pay attention to your values because that is what's going to make the biggest difference in making your work look realistic. A lot of people mistakenly think if they just knew the right color and put the right color in the right spot, that's what's going to make their work look realistic. It's not so much the color that will make it realistic, it's your values. Are your darks dark enough, your lights light enough? That is so so, so much more important than choosing the exact right yellow pencil. I mean, you could give me one of any of my yellow pencils, I've got a lot of them, and I would have been perfectly happy with the end result. It wasn't that big of a deal, as long as my values are correct. So really watch that. And I do want to keep my pencils pretty sharp here so that I can get into all the little nooks and crannies of that paper. Although, once I blended it out with the odorless mineral spirits, I noticed even where I was a little bit lazy and my pencils weren't super sharp, where I should have had a grittier look, it blended out really smoothly. And this is why I mentioned at the beginning of the video, I think I might like this paper better for working in colored pencil than the old batch, which really was a huge, huge surprise. I went into this expecting to hate it, being given what I'd heard from others, to and that I would have to go looking for an alternative. And while I do think I'm going to need an alternative for ink tents and watercolor pencil, for colored pencil, I really, really liked it. And that doesn't mean that it's going to be perfect for you. It depends on what what techniques that you're using, the way that you're applying the pencil and how many layers you want to get. One person had commented that they noticed they couldn't get as many layers on this newer batch as they could the older batch. I agree with that. That is definitely true, but... I found I didn't need as many layers to get the same color saturation and to get the detailing and everything that I wanted. So that wasn't a bad thing. As long if anything that cuts down the amount of time it takes me to complete something, I am all for it. As long as the end result is very similar. I mean, if it cuts down the time, but the end result is bad, then okay, there's an issue. But if I'm saving time, but pr producing the same quality of work, I am totally okay with that. And that's, that's basically what I found here for, and again, it just goes so much back to the techniques that I'm using. Somebody who works differently may not like it as much as I did. And that's really going to be true of any paper or any pencil, really. Adding some lavender in there. And the main thing that I'm, I'm focusing on here as far as color is that the wing, the tail, and the blue under the neck, those all need to be a very cool blue. So closer to purple on the color wheel, and I will blend quite a bit of purple in with it to make sure it stays very, very cool. Whereas the bluish color, that sort of teal color that's on his chest, I need that to be very, very warm, closer to green on the color wheel. So as far as choosing color, that's really all I'm focusing on at that point, making sure I've got cool blue where it needs to be and warm blue where that needs to be. Working here on my values, just darkening some of these areas up. I have to change the shape of the beak there. I had that drawn out a little bit weird, so I had to correct that. And I've got to go on this area by his face, or his cheek 
ne right next to his beak. I need that to be darker than what my reference photo is showing because I'm going to go on top of a lot of that with my touch up texture and titanium white mixture from brushandpencil.com with a brush. That's what you see me painting here. Never use acrylic paint, any sort of water-based paint, any sort of water-based anything. I've heard people using gouache over colored pencil. If it's something you're going to sell, if it's something that you want to be archival and not have this chip off or cause other problems later on, do not use water-based products. Use something, this is actually the only one I know of that is made for colored pencil that is intended to be used on top of colored pencil. You've got to remember these colored pencils are wax and oil based. So you don't want to use a water-based product on top of that. That means gel pens, that means your acrylic paints, any gouache, even ink tents, you don't want to use any water-based product on top of the wax or oil base. Now you can do the reverse. Let's say you did an underpainting with ink tents or watercolor or gouache or acrylics. You can go on top of that with your colored pencil, but not the other way around. Oil can go, the oil and wax can go on top of water-based, but water-based should not ever be applied on top of wax or oil-based. And I'm just painting on with this liner brush. This is a synthetic hog haired liner brush. Just painted on some of those white details. But I needed the white next to his beak there on his cheek. I needed that to be darker so that the white, when I came on top of that with the touch up texture titanium white mixture, would show up. If I didn't have that darker, darker than what it looked like it should be on the reference photo, then the whites would not have shown. Just more detailing in here. And with a touch-up texture titanium white mixture, I do have a video showing you how to use it. I'll have a card pop up so you can check that out. But remember, don't mix very much of it. It dries very, very quickly. So you want to make sure just mix a small amount and don't try to reactivate it. I've heard of people trying to add water to it or more of the touch-up texture. You're really, well, you adding touch-up texture won't make it less archival, but adding water will. That will kill the fact that this is an archival product to be used with colored pencil. As far as just adding more touch-up texture, you get a, a weird, weird texture out of it. It doesn't work quite right that way. So just mix a very, very small amount. Then you can rinse it out with water and reapply, make a new batch if you want to keep working if your first batch started to dry too fast. Lots of little details. I need to make sure that pencil is really sharp. And one of the things that I do to keep my pencil extra sharp, because you'll have a lot of lead still on that pencil, but it still won't be sharp enough for the tiny detail. So I take a piece of sanded paper or sand paper. You can get them in the art supply section. They come in these little kind of long rectangle box, um, shaped almost like a paddle. They're not very big. You can sharpen the pencil by twisting it on top of that sandpaper to get that really, really fine point without having to completely resharpen the pencil every time you need a sharper point. Now, this was something that I have to completely change how I normally work. I came through and layered in the greens and such for the, the little U shape. It looks all, almost like scales, the edges of the feathers. That's, by the way, not going to be the case for every bird, but for these guys, their feathers do have that edging on it. I added that, those in, and then I put the pencil on top of it, which I was apparently mi missing a clip of. But you can see several layers where I've got different shades of blues and greens, yellows, all kinds of, of stuff in there. When I blended, look at how I almost lost all of the edging on the feathers. So all of that work I did with that lighter green color, making my detail for, like I'm doing here, completely a waste of time because it's going to get blended out all of the way. And I did it a couple of times, kept thinking, okay, I just need to add more. But every time I blended out, because this isn't really soaking into the paper like it normally did, it sat on top. It just blended in with the other colors that I put out. So again, you're seeing that here as I blend out. Look how I'm losing those edges. So what I will do differently next time is get that base color as dark as I want. So all of those aqua and blue, yellow colors, all of that on the chest, I would get that to be as saturated as I want my end result to be and then I would go put that the little detailing of the edges on top of that which in the end is what I did but I wasted a lot of time trying to maintain all of the edging on those feathers as I worked that was the biggest difference I noticed with working in with the colored pencils themselves on this paper. I would lose a lot of the detail I normally would have blocked in early on. So now I'm just going to switch it. I'm going to get those base layers more of, for, focus more on those first and save the details for the end. Before I kind of worked back and forth and now I, I definitely found every time I would blend out, I would lose all of those details. It just blended in too much. So I think that's a good thing for things that you're, let's say, going to want to blend a really smooth background. I think it's going to be smoother than it was on the other paper. But when you're trying to maintain your detail like this, 
I'm just going to save that detail for the end when I'm done blending with the odorless mineral spirits. It just, it's almost slippery. Like it slides into the other colors instead of staying put. Like I said, I don't think it's a bad thing. It's just going to be a little bit of a different way to work. So again, coming through with the touch-up texture, titanium white mixture. Now with this, let it dry completely. And by completely, I mean give it a good 10, 20, 30 minutes. Dry to the touch is not dry enough. If you let it dry all the way, you can go on top of it with another color. So let's say I wanted some of the yellow to be brighter. Going on top of my blue colors with yellow, I'm just going to create green. It's too translucent. But if I put this down first with the white, anywhere where I want to be really yellow closer to the neck, I can come on top when that's dry with my bright yellow colors and it'll be so bold and vivid. Whereas, like I said, if it went on top of the blues, it's just too translucent. But make sure when you do that, let it dry all the way. But you can, can do that with any color. Let's say I wanted to have orange on some of these feathers. I would need to add the white first, let it dry, and then put the orange on top. And the orange would be nice and bold and stand out really well since I have that opaque white underneath it. Plus, the touch-up texture titanium white mixture, touch-up texture itself, the reason that that exists is to create more texture on an area. So let's say on his beak, I burnished and damaged the tooth of the paper, could not get any more detail. I can paint the touch-up texture. It comes in this little nail polish-like bottle. Just paint that over that area. It's clear. Let it dry. Now that that paper has more tooth, so I can get a few more layers on top of it. I don't have to find that I do that that often because I don't typically damage the tooth of my paper. I'm pretty careful with it, but that is an option for you. For the most part with me, I just use it as a mixture, mixing the two together. But like I, the point was it, it creates more tooth. So on an area, let's say I wanted orange somewhere. I put that down with the white. I've now not only created an opaque base, I've also added tooth to the paper in that area. So that orange is going to stick really well. So moving on to the red, look at that. That is one, that first time blending out with odorless mineral spirits, look how vivid that color is. And that is something I have not seen on any other paper I've worked on with colored pencil. It would normally take me a few layers to get something that bold, that deep, and blended that smooth. It almost looks like watercolor pencil or ink tense, the way it blended so smooth first layer through. And I'm letting that dry and then getting the base with the blues. And we'll come back while that area dries. Now, anytime I blend out with odorless mineral spirits, and that's what you're seeing on the brush, it's always blended with the odorless mineral spirits. I use Mona Lisa odorless mineral spirits, but you can also use Gamsol. They work exactly, exactly the same. But what I'm doing is letting it dry completely before I go back over it with colored pencils. If you work the colored pencils over an area that's not all the way dry, it the paper is kind of weak at that point and you can damage it. So I wanna let that paper dry all the way before I go on top of it with my colored pencil. So what I'll do is let one area dry and then work on another area, get that blended out. And then while the, I'm waiting for that section to dry, the previous area should be dry by then. So I just work, in back, work back and forth that way. More layering, just paying attention to where I want cool and warm blues. It doesn't matter to me if I have the exact right warm blue, the exact right cool blue. As long as it's cool blue or warm blue, I'm actually okay with it. And I had no problems working with the luminance, my pro color from Derwin, or polychromos on the paper. They all worked beautifully on this. I'm using a peach color there to start getting some of the highlights. I don't want to just jump straight to white because I'm not trying to create pink feathers. So I'll use a lot of the light pale oranges and yellows for some of the highlights on the tail. But really, the majority of what I'm doing here, I don't need to brighten things up so much as I need to darken up my shadows. And that will make the highlighted areas seem brighter even without having to add a bunch of highlights. I just need to get my darks dark enough at that point. More often than not, the problem that people have with their values isn't getting their lights light enough. Usually, it's getting the darks dark enough because that's scary. You feel like it's too much. You're going to go too dark. So build up to that slowly, but make sure you get the dark areas as dark as they need to go because that will make your light areas appear that much brighter. If your darks aren't dark enough, your bright areas will not look light enough. My next layer onto these feathers.
And this is another area. I don't need it perfect. As long as it's cool blue, I'm happy. So that means a lot of purple. I'm layering a, a fair amount of purple over my blue. Some of it is a little bit warmer, so I've got some green in it. But the majority of it, I'm using blues and purples. Adding another layer, darkening these up even more. As I work, I like to break things up into small sections at a time. I don't want to do all of the blue, like say, I know the wing and the neck and the tail, they all have the same colors of blue, so I'm not going to do all of those at once. For me, it's easier to tackle if I break it down into small sections at a time. It's not so overwhelming when you've got something like this that has that much detail. Make sure when you're working on the feathers that they are going in the right direction. They're about the right size, going in the right direction. On the tail feathers, those are larger, so I'm going to be more exact to my reference photo. But when I get up into the chest where there's so many tiny feathers, I'm not going to sit there and count and make sure they're all exact. What I'm going to do is just make sure they're going in about the right direction and they are about the right size. So you can see how they kind of curve around his belly, which helps to give you that more three-dimensional look. Using my white luminance here for some of the highlights. While I love my touch-up texture titanium white for a lot of the highlights, I don't want to use it everywhere because you don't want things to be that bright all over the place. Sometimes I find that I get better results adding white highlights with either my luminance white or my Derwent Drawing Chinese white. Those are, are my two most opaque colored white colored pencils. And for my final layers, I will get to the point where I don't really need to blend out with the odorless mineral spirits anymore. I'm mostly doing that on the earlier layers. Towards the end, everything is, I've got enough pigment on there and everything's blending smooth enough that it just doesn't need it. When you're looking at anything, when you're trying to choose your colors, look closer at whatever reference photo you're using. It's E to Z to look, like I said with the head, you'd look at it and go, okay, it's yellow, and just paint it in yellow. The beak is gray, just paint it gray. Look closer. Are there other values in there? Is it light and dark gray? Are there some black? Is there some brown? Watch for that sort of thing because that'll help your work to look more realistic than simply looking at it and going, okay, it's gray, paint the beak gray. So here on to the branch, I'm paying attention mainly just to where my lights and my darks are. I'm not too worried at this point about the perfect color. I'm using a lot of browns, grays, and this golden kind of orangey color. Yes, that is a technical term. I'm just kidding. I don't use technical terms. We all know that. You can just paying attention to the light and dark, and you can see how it very grainy gritty. It looks like colored pencil, or not colored pencil, it is colored pencil. It looks like crayon at that point on the branch. That's normal for your first layers. Once I blend that out, that'll smooth it out. And each additional time that I add multiple layers, then blend with odorless mineral spirits, let it dry, add more layers, blend with odorless mineral spirits. Every time that I repeat that process, it will get more and more smooth. The main causes of that grainy gritty look, if that's something that you don't like in your work and you're trying to avoid it, the main causes are using a pencil that is not sharp enough or pushing too hard on the paper too early on. And so you end up kind of flattening the tooth. You're almost burnishing. It seems like that would get rid of those lines and it will to an extent, but it also means you can't add extra layers on top because the paper is too damaged to take them. So that will prevent you from getting really smooth pencil. So I keep a light hand as I'm blending and that is going to let me apply more and more layers as I work my way through. Push too hard too early and you're really limiting yourself. It may seem like your colors are nice and dark earlier on when you do that, but you later on are going to wish you hadn't done that. And again, just making sure everything's blocked in here. I'm not terribly worried about every little detail. I just want color everywhere. I'm getting rid of the white. And in, when I use the frisket, sometimes when I airbrush the background like that, I'll have areas like that stick that's kind of randomly sticking up in floating in the middle of nowhere there that's close to the bird kind of pointing to his left wing our right that stick is too wide so what i will do is just find a colored pencil that is close in color to my background and fill that in just kind of thin that out that happens a lot whether it be the edges of the bird or the branches whenever i'm doing i i keep done that on tigers where i need some of the hair to kind of be fluffier stick through it and you can overlap each other the pencil will go over the airbrushed section it's not going to look exactly the same as where you work over white paper but you will get it 
close enough that you can correct edges if your lines are a little too thick or too thin in any area. With how small this is, I don't have a ton of detail in his feet, but I want some. I'm paying attention to some of the highlights and shadows. And the final details on this piece I do have for the live stream, and I'll have another card pop up for that if you want to watch in real time. I, I'll go through explaining how or why I'm doing different things with the details, and you can see what a difference it makes there. And a lot of the highlights that I'm doing here, it's not just this golden brown color. I'm using this gray-blue color as well for areas that are in the shadows. Watch when you're painting and drawing branches or sticks or anything like that. It's really easy to make them look too flat by saying, okay, here's my light source. I'm going to make sure everything on the upper right-hand corner or right-hand edge, all of that, anything on that side is going to be highlighted. The opposite will have a shadow. What ends up happening is you have a very, very flat looking branch. If you want it to look like it's three-dimensional areas are closer to the viewer and other areas are moving away, make sure you get variation in there. Besides that, on most branches, you're going to have leaves in there and so you're going to have some dappled sunlight where you will have highlights that don't make sense why there's a highlight in one area and a shadow in another and it's just because of how the sun comes through and bounces or shows in between those leaves and other branches one branch will cause a shadow on another so that is something to always be aware and watch that on your your reference photo where those highlights are that was something I struggled with quite a bit when I was younger all of my branches looked so flat but I was my brain said highlight this side shadow this side yeah, if I were doing lettering, that would look okay. But on a branch that I want to look three-dimensional, I want it to look realistic, I've really got to watch where those shadows and highlights are. And that's where having a decent reference photo is really going to help you in making something that looks more realistic. We have a tendency to think, I know what a branch looks like. I can do this from my mind. Don't do that, especially early on. If, you, if you're struggling with getting your branches to look realistic, Get a, a good photo that you can see where areas have light and dark because, like I said, they, they won't necessarily make sense because the, the sun will or light will shine through and kind of bounce around in weird locations that you're just not expecting. So really watch your reference photo with that. And there is my finished piece. Another tip for making your work look more realistic, assuming that is your goal, is don't try to perfect everything. Having flaws like here on the branch, a lot of the areas of this branch, the bark has been stripped back by the birds. That makes it look more realistic. I could fill that all in with dark brown, but it wouldn't look as realistic as having that sort of a flaw. Having sticks that are broken or snapped. If you're painting something that has leaves on them and some of the leaves are starting to die off, include that. That will actually make your work feel far more realistic than if every single leaf, every flower Petal. Everything is perfect. Include the flaws if you want your work to look more realistic. Now let's move on to this tutorial and talk more about the paper as we work. We, me and the mouse in my pocket. I don't have a mouse. I want a mouse. They're so cute. Actually, I probably would get one if they lived longer. I'd be sad because they don't live that long. This has nothing to do with this video. I just stop rambling now. Hey, have you subscribed yet? If not, I have a handy button right there. It's round, has an orange arrow going to it. If you click on that, that'll help you to keep up to date with all my new art videos every single week. Next week, we are working in watercolor pencils. Yes, again, me and the mouse in my pocket. I really do want a mouse. Can I just have all the animals live with me and not be considered a hoarder? I've limited myself to three hermit crabs, two Italian greyhounds, and a chicken.